uh, between everyone, and I've done a lot of listening. And a lot of the conversation has really been at the top of the funnel, right? So how do we acquire new customers, and how do we drive awareness? Um, and I don't think it's been a consistent message on the bottom of the funnel, how do we retain our most loyal customers? Um, and I think if you go back to the traditional loyalty sense of an old style program, it's more spin to get right. So you're, you're going to spend money, you're going to get something in return. But as CBGs, we don't have access to that first party data. Um, it's 2019, there's new platforms and technology, and that's where CrowdSwiss comes in. Uh, CrowdSwiss is a multi-channel engagement and loyalty-based solution, um, which gives CPGs access to first-party data that goes not only from purchase, but anything along the brand experience that we want to capture as part of the unique journeys that you guys are looking to understand um, that your customers partake on. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, so I spent actually the first five years uh, of my career working with Kroger in category development for carbonated soft drinks and um, health and beauty care. And the next five years, I spent uh, working at Macy's within category development as well for their vendors like Estee Lauder and Lancome. Um, the one consistent theme across those roles was really that uh, the, the brands and vendors, CPGs like you, wanted access to data. And they were paying a ton of money to Kroger and Macy's for access to secondary data of which they didn't have um, that first party connection and, uh, and ownership of the data itself. And that's always been the major challenge, right? Is that ownership of the data, and we've consistently heard that with the new privacy laws coming down, really owning that first party data is gonna be important, and a solution to own that data is uh, what I hope uh, I'll explain to you guys today. Um, so ultimately, brands must reevaluate. So Catalina recently posted a study that 90 out of the top 100 CPG national brands have lost market share. So that's due to a variety of different reasons, whether that's uh, private label commoditization, that's new category entrance, uh, shifting consumer um, preferences. Um, but ultimately, the, the story uh, which really supports CPGs, though, is that those CPGs that have emotionally loyal consumers um, are retaining customers at a higher rate. And they're generating emotional loyalty consumers by being authentic, but collecting data and activating that data on, um, on their customers. Uh, so why does retention matter? And, and why should we be talking about this while we're at conferences like this today? Um, we know that it costs five times more to acquire a new customer than it does to retain your existing customers. Um, and Bain and company did a study where it says just a 5% increase in retention is going to lead to a 25 to 95% uh, increase in profitability. Um, so those are really big numbers, but we're not really talking about it. Um, and we should be, because there's more reasons for emotional loyal, loyal consumers to be talked about. Um, brand, in, or, uh, yeah, brand Insider reported that 60% uh, you know, of your loyal consumers will tell friends and family about it. So word of mouth marketing from our emotionally loyal consumers is gonna be strong. 50% uh, of them are likely to join a program. 40% of emotionally loyal consumers would buy your brand despite cheaper commoditized options. Um, maybe not as relevant to CPGs here in the room, but 40% of customers would leave a product review on your site. Um, and then 32% or one out of every three customers uh, would be likely to engage in a promotion or a contest that you offer if you um, have emotionally loyal consumers. Um, so loyalty programs are a way to build emotional loyalty um, and increase uh, customer lifetime value. Uh, and ultimately, the real, uh, the real crux of that and how it would work is you just leveraging the data that you're going to glean. Um, and really where CrowdSwiss comes into the picture is we want to collect data from all different touch points um, that extend beyond the point of purchase. Um, that said, though, loyalty isn't going to solve everyone's problem. Uh, as we talked about yesterday and heard, if your product experience isn't um, great, you know, loyalty isn't going to solve that. The product experience comes first, the customer's already left. Um, but if you are a CPG and you are looking to build D2C connections with your customers, if you're fighting private label commoditization, if you're protecting share from new entrants, if you're seeking to build emotional connections and, have, and own that first party data, or measure uh, you know, ROI through your campaigns, um, a, a loyalty program could be right for you. So I know I've been speaking with a few people. Some people already have loyalty programs in market today. Um, some people are looking to, to get into the loyalty space. So I just want to provide a few tips on um, how to build a successful loyalty program for a CPG, and then as well as provide some examples from some of our clients today and how they're leveraging a loyalty program to drive their business. So ultimately, at the end of the day, um, a loyalty program really should be a cap about capturing data on your customers in new ways. Um, so we have programs uh, that operate and collect survey information um, they do uh, testimonials, they collect, um, they pump content and incentivize customers to digest new content from the brand. Ultimately, at the end of the day, what a loyalty program provides you is a new currency to incentivize your customers to engage with your brand 
to learn more about your brand and hopefully build that authentic relationship over time. Um, so first and foremost, again, about collecting data. Um, surveys is going to be a really great uh, thing. I think when AdWallet uh, did their presentation first yesterday, they talked about the first thing that a customer does is takes a survey. Um, and we also recommend that with a lot of our clients as well, just so we can understand what particular journey and path to put them on based on their uh, based on their stated you know, uh, needs, right? So if, for one of our clients, uh, Purina, for example, if they have a new kitten, if we find out that they're, they joined a program because they've acquired a new kitten, they're gonna go on a much different journey through our platform than they would if they have a mature feline in their household. Um, consumer profile and preferences, so again, understanding why a customer's joining the program. So um, for example, one of our clients, Disney, really wants to understand who they're buying for. So is it, are they really buying from themselves, or are they uh, gifting as part of joining the program? So then we can relevantly communicate the right offers to them at the right time. Um, and then, of course, collecting purchase and engagement uh, opportunities is going to be important for a CPG program. So through our platform, we have a variety of different ways for CPGs to capture first-party information. So Code Unpack, which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, similar to Box Tops from General Mills. Um, we also have Receipt Scan, so members are, can take pictures of the receipts to, to really collect information on purchase from wherever they make uh, that purchase. Um, but not only collecting the information is important, but what we do with our clients is really make sure that we're activating the data um, that they do get, right? So if we're acquiring data on, again, uh, why a member is joining the program or what their unique needs are, we want to make sure that we're putting them on that relevant journey and serving them up the right content and offers um, when it makes sense. Um, if we're collecting profile information about birthdays, uh, you know, about other milestones that um, they had as part of their brand experience, we want to make sure we're celebrating those at the right time because those are influenceable moments, right? The customer is captive at that opportunity. Um, and we want to make sure that we, uh, we, we use that opportunity to, to reach out to them at that time. Um, and then lastly, we want to be predictive about the life cycles and stages of our customers. So again, with the loyalty program, we're able to glean a ton of information that you may not have access to today and able to leverage that information in unique ways to understand um, when a, a customer might attrite or when a customer uh, might be ready to, to refer someone else to the brand. So part of the thing that we uh, do early on with our, uh, all of our brands is really map out the customer journey for key segments early on. So when a program is set up, the right, uh, the right activation points along those uh, influenceable moments are already uh, designed. Um, so whether or not someone is a, a new time or first time joiner, from the moment that they join the program, they might be put on a particular path similar to that Purina example I did where it's how do we, how do we uh, prepare for uh, bringing a new kitten at home and then what, how do we make, empower the customer to understand that they're doing what's best for their, their new adoption. Um, similarly, if we further integrate our clients into um, the, the brand story, then we can really understand through the combination of unique data points that we have um, based on previous uh, customers who may have done referrals, um, who might be prime and ready to refer someone else to the brand. So these are all capabilities that um, we're able to offer through a loyalty program um, yet that you might not have access to do today. So a few examples from our clients. Um, the first one is Budweiser Rewards, which I want to talk to. Um, and particularly with Budweiser Rewards is um, how they collect data and how they activate upon that data. Um, so first and foremost, with Budweiser Rewards, you can sign up for their program. If you, if you haven't, feel free. Um, but you would basically be able to upload a receipt um, from any point of purchase where you make a Budweiser purchase. So our technology can recognize uh, receipts uh, from wholesale channels, from uh, in, in bar environments, from in-game in sporting venues. Um, so we really just want to be able to capture and understand more about the customer and where they're making the purchase, wherever that may be. Another thing that Budweiser does is really, uh, really understand where the customer is engaging with the brand and really consuming the brand. Um, so what they do as part of the program is they actually uh, allow members to redeem their points for, in, uh, for ticketed events. Um, and what's great about that is then Budweiser can follow up with the customer to let them know, hey, when you attend this event, here's where you can find Budweiser in the stadium, for example. Um, Alternatively, if the event is not in stadium, but it's at home, and we're collecting the information on when a customer might um, host a party, for example, so recently for the World Cup, this was a campaign. Um, you know, we, Budweiser can reach out to the right audience as part of their um, population because we know that they're interested in uh, the upcoming uh, event, such as the World Cup. Um, and then similarly, if we, again, collect more detailed information about our customers, we can tell them and help them ex uh, experience the brand much quicker. So this is just an example of where um, based on where a customer lives, we can let them know where the closest opportunity and uh, location is for uh, the customer to make a Budweiser purchase. 
Um, from a promotional and marketing sense, um, so again, we can collect survey information on our customers and understand who their favorite uh, MBA teams are, for example. Um, and Budweiser does a lot of that around events and, um, and uh, entertainment, such as concerts as well, to make sure um, that we're always being most relevant in the communications we have back to our, uh, their customers and membership population. Um, another great thing about a loyalty program that you might not think of is how can we get customers to engage in new behaviors? So one of those for Budweiser is at-home delivery. Um, so they actually do a strong partnership with Drizzly, which is um, at-home delivery of alcohol. So um, through the loyalty program, we're able to incentivize the customer at the right times um, and for particular events that might be coming up to try out a, a, new, a new channel for Budweiser. Um, and then last, lastly about Budweiser is really about how they uh, connect uh, the customer between promotions. So I'm sure through all your brands, you guys are doing multiple marketing campaigns and multiple promotional events throughout the year. Um, but you need a way to connect the customer across those campaigns, and Budweiser Rewards is that um, mechanism for, for Budweiser. Um, so this is actually two campaigns that Budweiser recently ran. Uh, one was around the World Series, and another was uh, this past July, um, where in each instance, Budweiser was incentivizing the customer to go on unique journeys um, to earn an incentive at the end of that journey. Um, and along the, the journey, they were either incentivizing the customers to upload photos, um, to consume new content about product releases, and really just to understand more about what the, um, the brand is going on across all different channels. So the second tip really that I want to talk about today is how we uh, incentivize for the brand valuable behaviors that are relevant to your specific brand. Um, so we do a lot of work when we're doing program design uh, with our customers to understand what makes their program unique and what really is the program mission. Um, because ultimately there's going to be a brand story behind every program, but we want the loyalty program itself to personify um, all the, the brand mission statements um, that you might have. Um, so particularly if there's different ways that we can get consumers to discover more about your brand. So we're not, this isn't necessarily outbound, you know, um, greenwashing, for example. Instead, the customers joined the program, and now we're offering them an opportunity for themselves to digest the content when they want. Um, and we're able to uh, personalize that information based on uh, what we know about them over time. Um, social engagement is another opportunity area that we're able to, to support and then refer a friend. So one brand that does this really well and stays on brand is uh, Tarte. Uh, for those of you that don't know Tarte, Tarte is a millennial or a under 20 um, cosmetics brand. Um, they have a very socially engaged population who um, doesn't necessarily have as deep uh, deepest pockets as um, you know, particularly someone who might be buying a, a higher end cosmetics product. Um, and because of that, and because of the more youthful uh, brand that they have, their actually program is heavily uh, skewed towards the engagement aspect of their um, of the customer journey versus really trying to incentivize uh, purchase um, over time. So they do a lot of content engagement around tutorials and pro tips and really how to um, understand a little bit more about the product um, for their customers who are just trying it out for the first time because of their, their age group. Similarly, um, Tarte does a lot of UGC engagement and incentivizes for that through uh, the platform as well as uh, social engagement. So they do a ton of different work across all the different social channels and use the Tarte Heart Rewards program to incentivize um, the engagement with, uh, with the brand uh, through for many different social means. And then lastly, uh, refer a friend. So uh, Tarte, Tarte builds a community uh, of Tartlets as they call them, and you know, all the language is very flowery, uh, targeted toward that group about being BFFs over time. So they just make sure as part of their program that they're referring, or having their most loyal customers refer new people to the brand, um, because that's just what that generation loves to do, is share and bring their friends as part of the journey. Um, the last tip I would have if you're thinking about building a loyalty program is, again, authenticity. I think it's been a theme over the last couple of days, but making sure that uh, the program itself is authentic to what the brand experience is and really personifies, again, that uh, brand mission. Um, so that can be done through a variety of different ways, whether that's brand partnerships, um, curated member communities, or member-only events. There's a lot of different ways um, that you could be authentic to really, uh, again, personify that mission. So a third example of a, uh, an account that we support is actually Catchow. Um, we'd love to say that they've perfected the brand authent authenticity. Um, but really what they do well is build emotional loyalty with their consumers. And uh, we talked a little bit about this at the roundtable yesterday, if you were there. But um, 
Catchwell doesn't necessarily have, uh, you know, a mission. They shouldn't. They don't necessarily need to have a mission beyond nourishing an animal, right? Um, that's the product that they sell, and that's where their core focus is on. However, what they really want to do, though, is extend beyond that to build that emotional relationship to make sure that their consumers under, are, feel empowered that they're raising a well-nourished, a emotionally well uh, healthy animal, as well as a, an active and um, physically fit animal. So they look to provide ways um, of how they can empower their feline owners with a content that really focuses on those three pillars um, that don't that extend beyond uh, purchase. Another way that they uh, pump through uh, authenticity is really around unique brand voice. So they have a very unique uh, voice that they can um, tap in on, which is around cats, so pause up for perk points. Um, but you'll see a lot of the communication that they have through the program, it really is uh, catchy around you know, different cat-related um, lingo. Um, what My Perks does as well is uh, they have a curated community. So this is across social channels, um, but again, as well as uh, how um, gathering information from the community about how they took care of their cat or if customers have problems with their cats, you know, what did other people do to resolve maybe health issues that they had associated with their cat. So really helping through the My Perks program curate a community, build that emotional connection to the brand overall. Um, and they actually do that through uh, what's called Catopedia, which is um, a different articles based on all the different unique needs that you, you might have as being a cat owner. Uh, authenticity for the brand as well is done through charitable contributions. So as part of the program, members can donate points um, to their local shelters. And with the new evolution of the program that we're doing here, um, they'll be able to nominate local shelters as well. So really getting in, honing in on the local uh, aspects of communities um, that you know, members, is, members might have a stronger emotional tie to versus a national organization. Um, and the last thing that Pyrene does actually is they do cross-brand support. So clearly Catch Out is the, the focus of the My Perks program, but it's a part of a larger portfolio for Purina. Um, and they actually leverage the database for My Perks um, to, to support some of the other brand initiatives that might be going on as well. Um, and it, it's just a great opportunity, the loyalty program with the first party connection um, that you have. And one of those opportunities that we do is we know where the Purina customers most, most often shop. So if something changes amongst, amongst one of the brands within the portfolio, we can reach out to those consumers through the data that we've captured through the My Perks program. So at the end of the day, and I think there was a slide earlier that talked about this, but um, through, through a loyalty program with CrowdSwiss, we're able to capture unique data, but ultimately we want to be able to combine that data with other information that you guys have to have smarter data, as I think it was uh, termed earlier. Um, but also it's your data, right? So the data that we receive, we're going to make sure that it, um, you guys have the ownership and you can activate against it um, and make sure that it goes to the right delivery channels. So ultimately, why CPGs choose CrowdTwist? Um, I think first and foremost, again, it's that unique ability to capture first-party data and build 360 views on your customers um, that you may not have had the ability to do before. Um, outside of that, though, uh, CrowdTwist itself has a very marketer-friendly tool, so the back-end control center, which we have, can activate campaigns um, without any development resources uh, and directly on your site to encourage purchase um, wherever your customer may be buying. Um, all of our programs are innovative, so they use the same SaaS solution and technology. But if you look across the programs that we support, you'll see that they're very different experiences, again, tailored to the relevant um, channel or industry of which the, the brand is operating in. Um, and then lastly, um, what we support is, again, around those li different life cycle strategies, predictive, uh, predictive marketing to make sure that when we would expect a customer to engage with the brand, um, that she has done that. Or if we want a customer to make a referral, for example, that we're encouraging that behavior at the right time. So CrowdTwist itself actually supports three primary channels. So uh, CPGs, uh, we, we do support why we're here today. So from Budweiser to um, Nestle, Bush, Vitamix, uh, Newell Brands. Um, another channel that we greatly support is retail um, and then media and entertainment. So if you guys uh, have any interest in uh, how we support any of these brands, just step, uh, talk to me afterwards and I can highlight that for you. Um, and finally, about CrowdSwiss, so recently Forrester uh, published their Q2 waves on loyalty technology platforms, and CrowdSwiss was humbled to be recognized as the leader in the industry. Um, so again, if you guys have any questions on a, about our technology, definitely come up to me and let me know, and I can help you understand why CrowdSwiss was nominated or, or identified as the leader within the industry. So with that, I'll take any questions. If Thanks, Scott. Time. That's great. No, I appreciate that. Um, so, Scott, you're here with the team as well? Yep, Carter's with me. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. 
So if you have questions for these guys, I mean, we could maybe take a quick one now. I don't want to shut you guys down if you I have interest from the audience. Yep, we got one here. Let's, we, we can do this. We can do this. Just let us know who you are and where you're from. Hi, Dean Jackson, Life Extension. Uh, you mentioned in one of your slides the ability to kind of uh, look at different stages of the life cycle mm -hmm. and using variables to be predictive. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of kind of traditional transactional metrics, what other metrics are you using to kind of predict stages of the life cycle, for instance? And more specifically, if you can comment on kind of anti-defection measures or yep. predicting somebody that's going to a trip. So it's hard to answer that question specifically because generally the brands or the, the behaviors that we want to predict might be have different data that helps inform that decision, right? So one of our clients is Sleep Number, um, who their entire goal of being on our platform is to make a referral. Um, but one of the leading indicators for them of whether or not someone would make a referral is whether or not they've provided a testimonial as part of the brand or they've written a product review. Um, alternatively, if it's about making the next purchase, then it's really around analyzing RFM metrics, right, and understanding um, you know, what metrics would help predict when a customer should come in based on um, when they last made a purchase and you know, different variables come into play there, the size of your first order to um, you know, the frequency you may be logging into the program. Um, so it just depends, but those are similar type metrics. Okay. All right, well, thanks again. Sounds we good. appreciate thanks. Scott.